got a question for you, Peter. But the other, you mentioned the social uh, life for irrigators. Yes. It's different in your criteria. Um, I think Laurie mentioned um, uh, our yield of rice and the highest in the world and cotton are the highest in the world and the most water efficient both of them. Um, rice um, probably has the most environmental benefits with habitat for endangered species and whatnot. What is the criteria you would have for a social life for irrigation? Hmm. Is, it, is it yield or? So that's, a, that's a really good question and I'm going to deftly flick it to the panel in a minute but, but let me observe that um, when the Margiris headed to Australia to take its, uh, its um, AFMA sanctioned uh, allowable catch, you know, permitted licensed catch of small pelagics, it was the same number of fish that it was going to be, were going to be taken, they were just going to be taken in a more efficient fashion. and. Uh, and a, and a social network enabled community was uh, very opposed to that and the political response was swift. So I think social license to operate is a complicated thing. I think it's fragile and I don't know that we've yet really unpacked it in relation to the irrigation sector in Australia. And with that, I'll invite uh, comments on, on what, what our panel thinks is happening to irrigate a social license to operate. Perhaps, okay, yeah, Rhonda. Get a bit closer, sorry. Can you hear me okay, is this on? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, uh, I think the points Laurie were make, was making about rice is sort of a really good case in point where there was, uh, you know, there's been all this criticism, a lot of myths about um, excess you know, just based on how much water they use instead of about when they use the water, which is a key point. And uh, the whole, we're not a, um, you know, socialist uh, planning society. Uh, and the whole point of the basin plan was to set the sustainable limit. What uh, people do with the water is entirely left to the market and setting up trading regimes so that you can get, you know, it's all been based on getting the highest value uh, out of scarce resources. So, um, it should be, in my view, that uh, having a, uh, a sort of a clear line in the sand of what the policy settings are and making that clear, having rules for how that changes and having proper involvement of community in how anything might change in the future and having it um, you know, determined by the market how, how that precious water is used and having the capacity for that to trade so it can move you know, between uh, different, different uses in a way that uses in the best value. I, I would argue that that, um, you know, th that sort of combination of factors actually gives the, the social license to uh, irrigators. Now, your point, I know your point about the Margiris, which was about uh, there was a quota, so there was a clear line on what, um, uh, what could be um, accepted by uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the government sort of setting the standards in, the, in that way and that um, it was up to markets to operate within that. Um, so I think it probably is more than my simplistic sort of view of what the fundamental policy is, and there is a, um, uh, you know, the, the responsibility on irrigators probably to continue to sell the stories that just the way you did, Laurie, um, where and for other sp spokespeople who come out and talk talk about. So it is clear that um, uh, you know it's much more complicated than how much water you use per per. Um, uh, to get a certain value out of a crop, it's all about how you know when you use the water and how the water is used. I know, Laurie, if you want to add to that. Oh, look, I, I just say that when I take people around my farm, uh, if I've got something that's not right there, if I've got, you know, I've got a corner that's a bit waterlogged, or you know, I, I feel embarrassed. I, I don't like it. So, and I, like I think most people are the same. So. Um, you know, I, one of the great joys for me is driving around my crops, and uh, but a joy is driving around a good crop, um, one that's done well. And you know, I think I don't haven't met an irrigator yet that doesn't want to pass on his property in a better condition uh, than what he received it. And uh, so I think, and just a good example is when my grandfather moved to that area, they pointed they had the beautiful Edward River. He pointed his house away from the river and they used to throw their rubbish in the Edward River. Now, it's just, it just seems crazy. And why it seems crazy now is because we've come, come, to, come to love the landscape and, you know, we wouldn't even consider that. But that's what they used to do. So, 
Um, so I think as long as we're continuing to strive, and I, but I know, as you probably detected, we get a bit hurt when the Australian says, well, you know, we should be thrown out, etc. So uh, we're probably a little touchy, but, um, but I think we need to continue to strive, and all of us do, uh, is to make sure we're doing our job as well as possible. And I'm confident that in the basin, with the technology we have today, and the, you know, the education, passion, uh, that we can grow food as efficiently as anybody else, and probably more so. Bill, did you want to make? I'll make yeah, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, thank you. Look, I'd I'd agree with Rhonda with respect to the issues around water use. I think it's largely the role of governments in consultation with other players in the water sector to work out how much water is appropriate to be used and where where and when. But what uh, irrigators do with that water is up to irrigators and will be determined through the market. In t terms of a social license to operate, though, I think there are some uh, expectations on irrigators, um, but they're more from a couple of other perspectives in my mind. One around consumers' expectations on clean, green food production uh, and the value consumers place on that. And I think we've seen a couple of uh, examples um, both in Australia, around the cattle export and internationally in Europe recently around the our control of quality assurance through the, the, the production value chain of food uh, that raise questions and, and challenges for food producers to be um, uh, helping improve our, our, the, the QA along the value chain to ensure, ensure that things, issues like human health and animal ethics are being uh, looked after in our food production systems. And I think there's a role for irrigators to play in that space. The other issue I think for irrigators and the social license to operate is around the environmental consequences from their business and the off-site things. So issues around um, chemical use for uh, pest, disease control, fertilizer, and the runoff quality and the downstream impacts of that. I think there are issues there for irrigators in terms of their social license to operate. And there's a, a, a connected thing that's a little bit left field perhaps, which is not about a social license to operate, but just being clear about uh, water implications as uh, irrigators become more water use efficient uh, through infrastructure or better technologies uh, on their properties there is often a reduction in the return flows back to the river system from leaky irrigation systems that is a loss of water for the environment downstream that is not always captured uh, as well as it could be in our water accounting of, of downstream available environmental water mm. okay thank you another question yeah right at the front Just you were talking about the super controller and this issue of social license from what I've observed in the last couple of years. I think what people are concerned about is the decisions are being made for people in rural Australia by a noisy business and minority board, uh, and city based majority whatever you want to call it, through social media or whatever it is. And that's probably something that I think probably appeals more to common sense because super control became then an issue of semiotics almost, and then became politicised, then they say they're achieving the same thing, just in a different way. Mm. So if it's anti-science and it's misinformed information that's being fed into the policy and making the decision, that to me is what people get more concerned about. Mm. I agree, but I think a lot of this sort of going back, it, run, it runs off values and it runs deep and it's about trust. Uh, and confidence, and so you know, sort of, sort of capital, and and I've uh, found myself defending Australia's rice industry at far too many dinner parties, really, to to draw the conclusion that uh, that the rice industry has a, a high level of uh, community, you know, broad community support. I, I don't think it does, and I don't think that's good news. But I think it, it's the real situation. Okay, yes, up there. I'd just like to make a point um, in relation to Sergeant you said about social license and, and, and the rice industry. Um, I'm a rice grower and um, we have an environmental champions program and um, it's an accredited level accredited process of developing in response and it was developed a, a, a while ago in response to developing that trust and integrity that we have. And I think the, process, the production processes will reflect some of that. But to me, um, and I'm like Laurie, I'm very proud of what I do, of what I found with our support we produce. To me, the greatest integrity that I can pass on as both a rice grower and a wheat grower and a canola grower and a cattle grower is the quality of, one, of our food that we produce. 
And um, that, to me, is the most important thing that we do. And that's where I ultimately build my social license. It's not about defending my production system in the wider community. It's actually about that ultimate point in which people eat the food that I produce um, and the quality that they expect with the system delivering it to them uh, in the manner that they, they, they do. But I also think that much of this um, debate about social license and community and trust is that we've got such strong divisions between urban and, um, and rural landscapes. And those discussions have to be um, in fairly and free. Mm. I hope we continue to do it. Thank you. Any comments from the panel? Uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I understand all that. I guess the observation I'd make that uh, increasingly it's a globally connected food production system that we're part of. The majority of the rice grown here is exported to other parts of the world where I imagine the consumers have very little understanding of the conditions in which it's grown and, and possibly don't even care. Uh, and that is a challenge for the industry and likewise for the food that we import into this country. Often we probably don't know too much about where it was grown or how it was produced. And I think uh, uh, improving the accreditation and the QA and the information around production systems so that people do know what they're, you know, what they're buying, what they're consuming, is a good thing for all people in that system. Thank you. There's a question here. Can I, can I just ask people to introduce themselves? Sorry, I'm David Boyd. I'm a hazard. He's a what? About five back before we went to the org, he had a slide with a lot of points. Two pretty hard hitting dot points. Oh, you're challenging me now. <laughs> one, one, one was the, the lower lakes. Yeah. Thing. The other one was about the lack of um, breakdown, I think, in relationship to the irrigators and the grow and grass and grow and grow and grow States, states I yeah, look, it's more um, what we're seeing with a bit of concern. Yeah, what we're seeing with a bit of concern is. Um, no, back. Yeah, look, it's, it's of concern to us particularly that um, when the, the states and uh, and the authority aren't, you know, they're begging to differ, I might put it that way, at the moment. Um, and I think there's a real, there are a lot of uh, nuts and bolts activities that happen at the moment. And... Um, if we're going to have outcomes from the base and things like benchmark, we, we, we've got to invest in that. And um, I'm not sure, and I'm not saying it's the state government's fault. I'm not saying it's the authority's fault. But it, you know, people have got to get together because um, we expect advances um, in our sector. And, and you know, so what also worries me a little bit, I'll say, is that. Um, at the moment, there are one group of people that are being billed, and that's irrigators. They've all got our addresses, and we, we regularly write out checks for that. And I think to uh, just pass off our community service obligations uh, to the community of running this water system, uh, I do have concerns that uh, we might end up in a crossfire a bit there as well. So um, that was that point. Um, which other one did you have? It? Relationship between the state. Yeah, that's so that, that's the key point, um, because we, you know, we're a federated system. We rely on, we rely on getting, um, you know, that process working. Yeah, look, sorry, risk assignment. Uh, sorry, South Australia. Yeah, look, South Australia. I, I look, I'll, and I hate to get down to that parochial line because I'm from New South Wales, and you know, and we, we fire shots across the border, which is just totally unproductive. But uh, and one of the things that's often fired at us, I suppose. Um, is that, you know, we're the bad users of water. Well, I can remember about 10 years ago down to the swamp irrigators down there, and not trying to be too hard, we've all got our bits we've got to improve, but one of the processes there was you pump it on, pump it straight out of the river and you run straight back in. You don't even measure it. So that sort of sticks in the gullet. But well, I will say that South Australia have some of the finest um, pressurised systems in the world. Um, so... Uh, and I suppose one of the things that's concerned me a little bit, a lot of the things, you know, Lake Hindmarsh, the island, the marinas, um, 
you know, it is one of the playgrounds, and so I think we're all guilty of talking the talk, but walking the walk's a lot harder. So, um, so I don't mean to have a pot shot at South Australia. Um, we've all got our failures, and, and, and we hope that, the, that we spread the pain right across, and that's why it's got to be. Okay, Rhonda. Thanks. Look, I feel I have to address a couple of those. In fact, there are quite a few of your issues, Laurie, uh, with some great suggestions for future issues, which I agree to, but a couple of points of uh, many, a uh, few myths there. Uh, so first of all, on the, the states, it's absolutely right, and I made this point, that collaboration is uh, the only, only way forward, and uh, that we have uh, been intensely working with the states over the last uh, couple of months, in fact, in building that collaborative arrangement. And I think we are moving to, um, uh, to make, we are making progress. So I'm far more confident than Laurie. What uh, I think you're probably referring to is the budget scenario, which is actually not about the basin plan. In fact, the budget um, cuts that New South Wales and South Australia, well, New South Wales has made and South Australia has announced, they are cuts to the, um, to the running of the river, basically, to the programs that are uh, collectively uh, managed by the states. They make the decisions. We're just their agent to implement it. Most of the, um, the funding and the activities are throughout the basin. You know, the the MDBA is just the sort of the central coordinating, uh, directing hydrologists and so on, managing it in that way. Most of the activity is there. So they're basically cuts to their own services and to their own programs, assets that are owned by them. So it's actually quite, they don't, you know, you can't sort of separate things um, uh, absolutely in this world, but um, certainly the basin plan work and going to the next step on that, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic um, that that is uh, working quite well and moving along. And on the lower lakes, just to be absolutely clear from the way that we've done all of our work and scientific basis underpinning it, um, it wasn't driven by the lower lakes. In fact, it was driven by all of the hydrological sites that we had across the basin and their water needs were determined first. And basically the lower lakes needs were picked up by um, you know, the outflows of all of those. So they ended up with the residual of meeting the needs first. So it was certainly in the basis of which we did uh, all the work. It was, you know, the environmental needs of the whole basin. The political story was a Thank bit you. different. So th there are more questions than we have time, and I'll, that hands yeah, around for quite a while, so we'll make this the last uh, yeah, question. My name is James Houston. We're a primary producer upstream of the Hume Weir and the Upper Murray. Just wondering what the basin plan is doing for the top end of the, of the river health. What we're noticing in our neck of the woods is by the time we've got environmental flows, um, irrigation flows, generating flows for electricity, and then on top of that, um, a lot of floodwaters as well, we've got millions of tonnes of soil of prime grazing land ending up into the river, ending up into the Lake Hume. When we discussed that and raised that with our Northeast Catchment Management Authority, they um, handball that on, saying that the Hume is acting as a sediment trap, so there's no salinity issues happening downstream and blah, blah, blah. But I think the irrigators need to be involved in that part of the discussion, because when they're talking about the Hume Weir having 100% capacity, that's decreasing all the time because it's filling up from the bottom. If the irrigators are wanting to get water, the amount of water that they're actually getting out of a dam that's being stated as 100% full, but let, let's, it's let's invite, decreasing all the time. Let's invite panel, panel comment. Um, I think there's probably two issues to raise there. One is about the environmental management, the health of the uh, up, you know, the up, up waters, the um, upstream of, of Hume, and the, the headwaters in pretty much most of the catchments of the uh, basin are, in terms of water extraction, um, are reasonably um, fine. And in fact, all of the modelling we did, we, which is only on water use, uh, certainly showed that to be the case. But the, as Bill said, that um, water is just sort of one part of the environmental health of, the, uh, of those areas, and a lot of the issues you talk about, I think, are much are those broader natural resource management ones. Um, as to whether the uh, silting up of the Hume Dam is creating a significant effect on capacity, 
Actually, I don't know if I can answer that. And then Bill, if you have anything, this is, uh, it's not been an issue that's been raised uh, with us, but it'll certainly take it on, see if I can find an answer. Similarly, I don't know, don't know the answer, but my uh, perception would be that it's unlikely to be a major issue, that the majority of the sediment that's moving will be uh, fairly fine and will stay in suspension and go through. I'm not aware of uh, uh, large sedimentation rates in Hume, but I'm, I guess it'd be very interesting to look at any data uh, around that issue. Um, yeah, they're spending a lot of money reinforcing the wall. Uh, you have spent a lot of money reinforcing the wall because of the instability of the dam site and the fact that it moved downstream for a while. Um, but I don't think that was anything to do with sedimentation. Um, but it's, it's a, certainly in many parts of the world, sedimentation of reservoirs is a huge issue and higher, uh, you know, higher energy coarser sediment environments. But I, I don't think it's a huge issue for our inland reservoirs. It is for some of our um, more coastal ones. But it is becoming a huge issue for us because we are losing large tracts of land. Yeah. Know, tons well, of tons of soil are ending yeah. up in the river. Yeah, so it might be a, some, a conversation that can be followed up you know, through the, com, uh, the commission, but I guess I would come back to what I said. You know, I think the integration with NRM management, catchment management and other issues is important here, um, yeah. but I think it's, it's much of the water issues for the plan are downstream of the reservoirs. Um, the only other thing is because of how we are likely to manage the reservoirs differently, there is a whole lot of flood risks as well and that we may be uh, having reservoirs fuller more of the time, um, uh, but with a longer term trend of a drying climate, which will counter, uh, counterbalance that. I'm going to let Laurie have the last word. Just, just on a small part of your question, I think one of the most extraordinary decisions Australian governments made recently was the privatisation of Snowy Hydro. Um, they have, con it's, it's almost a little potentate up there. Um, they have very, uh, they have, for example, as a co commercial in confidence of how much water they've got, what their release patterns are. Um, they're almost a, well, I'll make the comment. Yeah. They're almost a rule unto themselves. And I know, I'm not sure whether it's the living Murray process or, but as far as the ability to actually influence those flows above Hume, I believe, in some instances are fairly limited, the influence you can have. So it's quite an extraordinary decision of government to do that. And, you know, it was based on uh, power prices and money. And I, I personally believe it was a very poor decision how it was done. And on that note, I'd like to invite you to uh, join me in showing your appreciation for these speakers today. Um, next, next session is back in the in, in plenary, the final session at four o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>